Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, hear success stories, and learn tips and principles for bringing out the best in everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Rule, and this is Human Potential at Work. I'm joining, of course, from my home where we are stay home, stay safe um, in Richmond, outside Richmond, Virginia. And my guest today is somebody that has been a mentor to me for many, many years, and she's actually been on the program before. She was one of my first guests. She was actually episode 30, which I highly recommend going back to that episode and watching. She's, I used to tease her because she, she and I both um, served together on the Disability Colon IN, which was formerly the USBLN board for years, and we were both officers um, on the board at the same time. And when we would at, we would be pondering or strategizing or asking questions, and and Deb would go to talk. It's like, okay, everybody be quiet. She's gonna say something brilliant, <laughs> and she always would. So I just she's somebody that has been very influential to me and really guided my thinking along the way as I've, you know, as I've really worked on uh, disability inclusion all over the world. And she, she just has, um, she's a very calm wisdom that I think is um, something that's very important right now during these very interesting times. So Deb, thank you for coming on the program again. And I, and I know you are the CEO of Deb Daggett Diversity. You were the former Chief Diversity Officer for Merck, which is a pharmaceutical company that you know has been doing a lot of things with the legacy that you left to make sure people with disabilities are meaningfully included. But tell us more, especially those that might not have seen your earlier episode, Tell us who Deb Daggett is and the work you do. And, you know, you have such, you're, you're, you're just such a mentor to me. So I'm really honored to have you back on the show. Well, thank you, Deborah. And um, we always used to joke about which Deb people we're talking to. Um, <laughs> and um, I've learned so much from you with um, all the work that you've done globally, uh, much more than I have all over the world, as well as uh, you're a social media maven and have taught me a lot about that. Um, and and chatting on social media and connecting that way. So I thank you for that. And um, I am really excited to be a part of today's conversation. I think it's so needed right now. Um, yes. People are really scared. Um, and uh, for those of us in the disability community, um, it is not an unfounded fear. Um, there is a lot going on, but we're not gonna um, dwell on that too much today. But I, I do want to raise awareness uh, so that those who, of us who love someone and are in a position to help someone with a disability understand what's really needed and what we can personally do. And those of us who have a disability uh, can draw on our many strengths to make this work. Um, this is familiar territory for a lot of us. So yes, um, I was a, a vice president and chief diversity officer for 22 years. The first half of my career was in the tech sector, where you think you would have thought I would have gotten really tech savvy, but it didn't work <laughs> out that way. Um, and uh, then uh, in the pharmaceutical sector, and I've been doing consulting for about, um, believe it or not, seven and a half years, which is hard wow. to believe. It's just flown by. And uh, so anyway, thank you again for allowing me to be part of today's show. Yes, and you know, I, I believe that the world has a lot to learn from the community of people with disabilities during these crises because the reality is, and of course, you know, there are over a billion people with disabilities. Some are visible, some, you know, are, you know, hidden. And, and I think learning about dealing with social isolation and not being included and not being able to be included because of what's going on. I just think our community has a lot to teach the world um, about thriving in these times, um, thriving despite not having the right technology. I was, I was, I saw an article this morning that 70% of children in New York don't have the technology they need to really be able to do online learning uh, at a time when we have all come home and everybody is supposed to be at home learning. So we're seeing the big gaps, we're seeing the accessibility, we're seeing the barriers that we have been talking about as disability inclusion consultants for years and years and years. And it's, 
it's becoming very real to a lot of people right now. So I think our community has a lot to teach the world, but at the same time, you know, you know, what would you, Deb, what would you recommend for employers that are dealing with that employers that are recognizing and trying to address um, their employees, including their employees with disabilities, working from home, making sure that everybody's still productive and we're still moving forward with whatever, you know, needs that we have as, you know, you know, workers, but what would you recommend to the businesses and you know, the employers that are dealing with right now from the perspective of both the community of people with disabilities, but really with everybody since, you know, people with disabilities are people first. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And there are some things that um, I think employers need to be aware of um, and, and try to help with. And um, there's also some strengths that um, employers can draw from, from their employees with disabilities. So some of the concerns are, um, there are a broad range of conditions that would put someone at much greater risk for um, being infected with the virus. And so you're going to notice um, a level of hypervigilance um, of people uh, seeming uh, to others to take things to an extreme. But um, it, it is because they um, are likely uh, experiencing a higher degree of risk in the event they're uh, uh, infected. There's also many people with disabilities who are also caring for loved ones who are at a greater risk. And so they're thinking about their whole household. Um, they worry about having to out themselves um, if, in order to get the accommodations they need. Um, so if their job isn't one that has, is already being done remotely, they may need to ask for that. Or if they are working remotely, they need, may need some additional um, digital access support in order to make the accommodations work um, when you're uh, having to access things like what we're using today, which is fortunately very accessible, Zoom. Google right. Hangout is also accessible. And there are other platforms, Microsoft Teams, but some platforms are not accessible. And so companies really need to think about the platform that they're using. Um, people, I, I have to tell you, people I talk to, their biggest fear is if their condition requires that they get regular care, whether that's chemotherapy or dialysis or um, I'm a person with brittle bones. I really am afraid. What if I trip or ha have a fracture now? Because right now you can't go to a doctor's office or an ER for typical things that you know you would do to manage your disability without putting yourself at a lot of risk. Um, right. There and are all your loved ones too, as you yeah. said, because people with disabilities are caregivers. Exactly. Um, uh, you and I are both examples of that. Um, my spouse, my aging mother, and my children are all people with disabilities, so caring for them as well. Um, stress reactions to this situation can really aggravate underlying conditions like depression and anxiety. And um, if your uh, health provider isn't currently providing telehealth options to see a counselor online, looking into adding that as soon as possible. Um, and this is an excellent time to leverage your employee or business resource groups uh, to do storytelling and to convene gatherings. Um, I've heard of what's called happiness hours, um, just to relieve some of the stress. And this is for all groups, not just those with disabilities. Um, on the plus side, it is important to note that many people with disabilities are more adept and adaptable to this kind of a situation uh, because with a chronic condition, you are um, more likely to have been in what I call uh, lovingly incarcerated. <laughs> so, you know, whether it was because of a broken bone or a surgery or something like that, I found myself isolated from people and having to work remotely probably at least a third, if not a half of my life. Um, and so I, I had to, you know, get strength in that area. And many other people with disabilities have done the same. And one of the things 
that happens is you learn to appreciate things. So for instance, while a lot of people are freaking out right now with having to shelter in place, <laughs> I am so glad that I have the uh, ability to cook food I like. I can uh, take a bath without anybody's help. I can go out on my back deck. I get to decide what I'm going to wear in the morning. I mean, these are all freedoms that I uh, appreciate every single day because there was so much of my life that those freedoms did not exist. So it's, it's learning to notice what you have, not what you don't. Right. Um, right. And, and so anyway, that's probably enough <clears throat> about that topic. Hopefully that's helpful though. Well, it is helpful. And, and I was watching the news and, and I'm very careful about what I watch and what I consume. And I, um, and it, there, I, I saw today that, um, there are a couple of drugs that we we think might help with the coronavirus, and so doctors are actually um, ordering all these prescriptions and hoarding them for themselves and their family. This is what the television was saying, and and it, it was really troubling. And there was a woman on there that has lupus, and she was talking about that she uses these, you know, for her life. And so, as we you know, we're seeing, hoard at first we saw, you know, hoarding of toilet paper, which was a little irrational, yeah. but now we're starting to see hoarding of pharmaceutical drugs, which also makes right. people living with chronic health conditions more at risk. And that, you know, it, it, you see things, and like you said, sometimes you just get more and more scared. I saw a story that I'm not going to talk about on air about something that happened in a nursing home in Spain yesterday. And I had a really hard time sleeping last night. So I have to be careful with my own mental health. I am somebody that has, you know, depression and anxiety, like a lot of people do. And I have to be careful what comes in and what comes out to make sure that I'm staying as stable as possible during this time. Because my husband, of course, is living with early onset dementia. And it's a very, he, we've progressed, you know, a lot with this. And he, I have to protect him. You had mentioned something about being a prisoner. My daughter, somebody jokingly said to her and her roommate that's in a supported apartment living that they were like prisoners. And my daughter came to me and said, mom, what? I know she was kidding, but I didn't understand why she said we were prisoners. And I thought, please don't kid. Please stop kidding because say, I need Sarah to be calm and safe, you know, being a, a young woman with Down syndrome. And it, it, our language matters right now. We can actually freak each other out a little bit more. But I, I think that you gave some really, really good tips along the way. Um, of course, we know that as businesses are making decisions and um, there's a lot of things happening right now, we see a lot of really cool brands stepping up and seeing how do we help? How do we help? And I'm doing everything I can to keep acknowledging the business, the corporate brands that are stepping up to help, you know, kudos to the Googles and the Amazons and the, you know, there's so many now, um, Estee Lauder. Estee Lauder just, you know, started um, taking their um, labs and, and their plants and using it to make sanitizers. Uh, it, there's so much good happening, as you noted, in these dark times that we, we have to, you know, be sure to acknowledge those too. Um, and so, he, you know, we want to make sure that as corporations and brands are trying to decide what to do, that they know that their employees with disabilities are resources to them. And one thing I'd like you to talk about, Deb, is that we certainly have a, we have a very important saying in our community, nothing about us without us. But I think sometimes those lines get so blurry and confusing because are we talking about when these topics only including people with visible disabilities? Because there are many people that don't have visible disabilities. Now, I think, of course, part of that is you need more than one person with a disability. It would be really nice, you know, if you were, you know, being diverse about including people with disabilities in your diversity conversations. But let's talk a little bit about that. Why, why does that continue to be so important? And once again, what can employers, as they're making the, these decisions, learn from our community that has gotten pretty good at a lot of these things because they had no choice? Right, right. Great question. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's important to understand a couple of statistics. One is that 75% of disabilities are non-apparent. 
You're uh, not going to know the person has a disability unless they're under a certain situation where the disability becomes obvious, um, like having skipped a meal or being too hot or too cold or having to walk too far or the fire alarm going off. But um, most disability, 75% are non-apparent. And according to a 2018 Center for Talent Innovation study, 30% of the college educated workforce um, that is in a white collar job identifies as having a disability. So 30% of college educated people who are in white collar professional jobs, according to this esteemed research organization globally have a disability. Now, when we say not about us without us, what employers think is, well, we don't have any because they're looking around for somebody who uses a wheelchair or a white cane or has hearing aids. Um, so what you need to do is to create an, an environment where people are comfortable self-identifying so you can do that not about us without us. And to your point, Deb, it should be more than one person. It should be people that have a broad range of conditions and who represent other intersections of difference, whether that's race or LGBTQ or veterans. Um, and it, it's important to note that the solutions uh, for getting through this crisis um, are gonna need to be customized to your business, your culture, and um, your employees are the best ones to take all this great information that is coming out about how to help your, uh, work, uh, your work teams work better virtually or um, how to make remote work work better because they are familiar with your tools and how things work and the language that will work best. If you're moving to an open office environment, um, adopting a new application for employee productivity on your IT tools, um, looking at your online presence with your customers and the, and the way that you're communicating, um, or just doing a better job of making people feel more comfortable asking for an accommodation um, and, and then utilizing it, whether it's a temporary disability or a long-term one. They, um, the, the people with disabilities in your workforce can help you identify the best solutions and also, by the way, the lowest cost solutions. Yeah, I agree. Um, and you would, yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say that, um, you know, when I left Merck, I, I got involved with disability in as a consultant because I like their model of businesses teaching each other. Right. So um, if you're a business um, or you're an employee in a business and you can't figure out how to do this, um, you're not alone. You could talk to someone that um, is in a business in a role similar to yours who's invested in disability access and inclusion and who can um, show you the steps to get there. Um, and and I, the last thing I'll say on this topic, there's also a great free resource that I love working with, uh, the Job Accommodation Network. Oh, I agree. I love They're them amazing. too. And whether you're working remotely or you're you know working outdoors or you're in a grocery store or a healthcare worker, whatever the situation is, Jan has great information and support, and it's totally free. So, and totally confidential. It totally there, they, it's totally confidential. Right. Whether you are an individual, you're an employer, it's totally confidential. Nobody's going to come, you know, knocking on your door asking you why you didn't accommodate an employee. It's totally confidential. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I only say that, Deb, because I've had employers say, oh, no, I don't want to use um, askjan.org because, you know, the government funds them. And I said, no, no, no. You, the, we, you really do not have to worry about. They have just, hundreds of thousands of requests that they deal with every year. I mean, you don't have to worry about that. They're, they are professionals and they're on all of our sides. I, I wanna ask you now, dig in a little bit more to something you said earlier, Deb, because you had mentioned in using the employee resource groups. And so I would say to you, uh, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions on that all at once. So um, if you have an employee resource group, 
you know, how do you best utilize those talented people that have identified that they are either part of or they really care about this community? Um, what if I don't have an employee resource group? You know, is this the time to try to start one? Um, and why does it matter? <laughs> Trick question, not really. Why does representation matter, Deb? Thank you. Well, you know, if you don't have a formal employer business resource group, um, you can convene like a diversity advisory council made up of people from various demographics in your workforce and let them know you value their feedback and um, um, offer them opportunities to review materials or to brainstorm on solutions to a question that you have. Um, in the early days of um, Merck, before we had ERGs for all the groups, we often would do that, and at the other companies that I worked for as well. And you'll, you'll find that if you bring people together and give them an opportunity, um, they're more than um, happy to contribute. Um, they find value in that. And then you have a business case for why you need people to self-identify if you want to do that for any reason, like whether you're a federal contractor or not. If, if people start to see that the reason we want to know who you are and how you identify is so that we can tap into you as a resource. And when that's what people are seeing, they're more likely to self-identify than if you just simply ask them to fill out a form. I agree. I agree. Um, did that answer the question? It did. And I'm going to, I'm going to throw another question at you in the, in the same vein, because one thing that I've seen is that when an employee resource is done poorly, mm -hmm. without thought, it can actually get you in more trouble than when you started. I've seen um, companies not really taking it seriously and their employees being joining the group. And then they don't feel they have senior management support or there's no budget or you know, there, it, it doesn't feel like the company's really supporting it. I've actually seen um, talented employees quit and leave the company. So it is very important that you do it in the right way and that you honor the efforts. These employees are taking their time to say, no, I want to help you be better at this. And yes, they work for you, but you have to, the employer has to honor the contributions that the employees are making. And, you know, of course, it's got to be reasonable if they say, you know, if they're asking you to do things that aren't reasonable for the business. It's got to be a dialogue going back and forth. But I didn't know if you wanted to just touch on that because we've seen some failures that get companies in trouble too. Not to scare companies because there's a lot of good ways forward. But right. you do have to, this is not something you just, you know, throw together and you just plant a seed in the ground and just hope for the best. There's actually. <laughs> well, you know, that actually comes out of a bigger uh, meta problem, Deb, that you bring up in that um, for uh, during the last recession, um, there was a lot of uh, disinvestment in diversity and inclusion functions. And people started um, either being laid off or moved to a lower level. And so they stopped treating diversity and inclusion as a core HR competency. And so you saw all kinds of things start to go awry because you didn't have a diversity and inclusion professional, whether it was running employee resource groups or ensuring equitable pay or um, addressing um, concerns around discrimination. Um, all kinds of things started to fall by the wayside. And we're still seeing this, um, you know, before the, the virus outbreak, there was a 23% growth in the um, number of jobs and budget uh, being invested in diversity and inclusion. People came back to it. They got religion. But guess what? So many HR professionals and young people had fled the function because it was the first to go when right. HR was downsized or there were budget issues. So now we see people coming from other parts of the business um, being told, voluntold, that they have to be the head of diversity because they, quote unquote, look the part and may have been involved in an employee resource group. And those are my, those are the folks that become my clients. You know, these folks that 
are um, panicking because, you know, I've just been told my, by my CEO or my CHRO that this is now my department. Um, it's me, myself, and I. I have very little if no budget, and I've never done this before. And so we still expect something good to come of that? That's not going to work. So we have to reinvest in DNI and sustain that for the long haul. Because if we don't, whether it's ERGs or other initiatives to enhance engagement, retention, and development of the talent that we so uh, badly need um, to fill critical jobs, we will continue to struggle. I agree. I agree. And you had, we'd mentioned um, disability colon in um, earlier. And what kind of you know, how can a, a company during these, this crisis go to an organization like Disability In that has consultants, very talented consultants working with them like you, to, to figure out how to even begin if they haven't been in these conversations? Yeah, so fortunately, Disability In, if you just go to their website, and again, I'm not their employee, I just consult with them, so I'm not trying to sell anybody anything here. They're a nonprofit organization. But if you go to disabilityin.org, there's a ton of free resources that sit on that website. And for a, a relatively modest fee, you can become a corporate partner. Um, or if you're you know, really serious about this work, you can become an inclusion works company, which is a group of now 48 firms who work together to accelerate disability inclusion. There are webinars, there are uh, stock photos you can use for your website that show people with disabilities in the workplace. Um, there's a global directory. Um, one of the cool things you can do is um, the business and disability communities came together um, about seven years ago to form um, a benchmarking tool called the Disability Equality Index. I was a part of that effort and it's based on the human rights campaigns, LGBTQ plus uh, survey ca um, called the Corporate Equality Index. And we were very fortunate that um, allies from the LGBTQ plus community helped us build a tool that now um, over 200 um, companies are using and you can see those questions online any time of the year. Um, and that, that tells you exactly what you need to do. And if you, you know, have to say yes um, to only a few questions now and you want to say yes to all of them, there are all kinds of resources through disability and to get to yes. So right. that's what I would point people to. And I'll, I'll make a comment about the Disability Equality Index. One thing we were worried about on the accessibility side of the house was there were not enough questions about accessibility, but I know they're constantly updating it, listening to the market, trying to learn and let it evolve. And so the reality of disability inclusion is not just about HR, as you very well know. It's not about just diversity and inclusion. It's really about the entire organization. So everyone in the organization, all of the groups have a role to play. And so, but it also, we have to start. And so they're really good questions and you have to start, we have to support each other. I also wanna say a group like Disability and wonderful resources, there's a lot of other really good resources, but I think there's something to be said about working with the consultants. And we, I, you know, I'm a consultant, but you're a consultant, you're a very successful uh, entrepreneur. And sometimes you really just need a consultant to help you figure all the moving pieces out. So we all have parts to play in solving these problems. And so tell us more about your entrepreneurial journey. Cause I, I was proud to be there with you when you first started saying, go for it, go for it, go for it. You're going to yes. be so good. <laughs> yes. When I was terrified and didn't know if that was going to work out, you were in my corner reassuring me and um, I really uh, needed it and have a, um, continue to appreciate that, that you were in my corner and, and, and had confidence. Um, I have to say, I, you know, I'm glad I had the opportunity to work internally for more than two decades. Um, but being external works so much better when you want to be unleashed and unplugged. And, and it gives you an opportunity to help your um, clients in a different way. So 
when you're internal, um, you have a really hard time not getting caught up in the politics and the drama. And there can be quite a bit of friendly fire from HR when you're in the diversity role. And if you're a consultant, you can be a prophet from another land. You can come in and speak truth to power and the slings and arrows don't stick. You know, there's no blood, no scars. You walk away um, and you have the gratefulness of your client who um, had to hear the tough love without having to deal with um, all the negativity that can come from, you know, the, the person who said, this is what you, this is what you're going to need to do, or this is what's going on here that needs some attention. And it can be the exact same thing that the internal person has been saying. But for some reason, when you're the external expert, it's like suddenly they can hear it. And you just have to have that relationship with your primary client that, look, I know I'm going to be saying what you've already said. I know you're the expert, but I'm here to help you out and, um, you know, to, to take the fire um, away from you so that you can keep doing the work and, and get the affirmation um, that there are things that need attention here. Well said. I've, he I've heard that so many times. I said that exact same thing you said, Deborah. I've said it a hundred times, yeah. but yeah. you say it and boom. Yeah. And, and I, I've had the experience because I worked in corporate America for 25 years in the banking industry. I had the exact same experience. It's like, oh, but I told you all that, but no, nope, got to pay some. Anyway, so it, it's just, it's sort of funny, but it's like you said, but you've got to be a partner with the customer that you're working with, your primary person. And, it's, and there's so many moving parts with this. And I think one thing that you and I have done and others is that we have to make room for each other because I, you know, I was very focused on accessibility. And I remember when I, I wanted to do more work globally, Jill Houghton at the time said, Deborah, go out there, find your wings. And I remember, and I, I just want, I, I, I want to bring this point up because I remember this sometimes. I remember asking you a couple of times if you could get more involved in some of the global work that I was doing. I was doing national work too. And you were saying, I'm going to choose to stay working in the U.S. because I'm really worried about accessibility issues when I leave the States. Right. Yeah, that, that's unfortunately uh, the case. So um, I have a service dog. And when I tried to get reassurance that, you know, she wouldn't end up being confiscated in quarantine, um, even if it was something like a cruise, I couldn't get any assurance. Um, and, you know, since she's an emotional support dog, how am I going to work if um, not only I don't have her, but um, now I have to worry about whether she's safe and how she's feeling. Um, and then the access issues, um, you know, no one who's had a disability most of their life would tell you that your disability gets better with the aging process. <laughs> Um, it always causes things to be, you know, uh, more of a challenge. So uh, the condition I was born with um, is called osteogenesis imperfecta, or better known in layman's terms as brittle bones. Well, guess what? You know, after menopause, my bones got even more brittle. And right. the idea of being in another part of the world with a broken bone with a physician, this is, of, of course, pre-virus, that has never taken care of someone like me. Um, and it's not the same. Like if, if a person is not familiar with my condition, who's an x-ray technician, and they take an x-ray to see what's broken and if it needs to be operated on, all they get is a lot of white light. Well, the reason for that is my bones are so thin that you have to set the settings very differently to be able to see anything. Um, oh. and, and they don't listen to the patient. Right. Uh, what would you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and my my the lower half of my body is as much metal as anything else. And so imagine trying to get an MRI or a CT scan mm -hmm. or check, you know, your bone density when you've got all that metal going on. So I, you know, did a lot of global travel throughout my career. I loved it. Um, I learned so much. But I also learned how hard it was. And this is right. when I was walking with the cane. 
Um, when Dan and I tried a few times right after I started using a wheelchair, my husband, uh, Dan and I, to go to various places. I mean, believe me, wheelchairs and cobblestones and tall curbs and it's just a nightmare, um, especially if you could break a bone if you tip over. So um, yeah, I, I really admire people who do the global work. It's so necessary. And I, what I do uh, to compensate for that is anything I create, I give away outside the US. I don't charge a thing. You can translate it, you know, it'd be great if you give me credit, but even if you don't, you can have the Prezi, you can have the accommodations guides, anything I have ever created, you are welcome to. Um, Cause I can't be, unless we're gonna do it virtually, which I have right. done a few times for various countries, I can't be there in person, but I can give you everything that I have available. Which right now is so relevant when all of it should be teleworking. I, I know my speaking engagements and conferences and stuff started getting canceled in January, and I was happy with that yeah. because, once again, I have vulnerable people uh, around me that I, I don't want to expose them. But, Deb, you, you brought up accommodations. We've talked about accommodations a little bit, but tell, you know, let's dig into that a little bit because accommodations, I, I know when I've been interviewed over the years about accommodations, I, I would try to make a point of using um, examples that were not about people with disabilities. I would say, you know, and, and these were true stories. I had a gentleman that broke his shoulder and it was such a bad break that he could not really use one of his arms. So at the time, you know, everything has changed so much since that time, but that was at a time when we were all using full-size keyboards. So we got him a mini-size keyboard. And then there was another that, you know, really had a terrible accident and could not walk. And, you know, we, we made some accommodations for that. And then of course, we really want our employees to be productive and successful at work. So we provide accommodations for people that are blind, like screen readers and, and things like that. And, and I agree with you. Ask Jan, which I've had on shows before. Uh, I do two different shows. So sometimes I forget which show they've been on, Access Chat or Human Potential at Work. But big fan, big fan of Ask Jan. And, you know, there's so many wonderful tips they have about accommodations and and you can find a lot of those resources right on their website without even talking to them but tell us more about what if you know what if corporations do right now to try to help accommodate people with visible or invisible disabilities and then also what is the responsibility of the individual especially if i haven't disclosed mm -hmm. great question and you know um i wrote a um an article about disclosing a disability um, that that uh, I've gotten a lot of helpful feedback on um, from LinkedIn. And one of the things that companies don't realize is that if you have a non-apparent disability, it may be harder to ask, but easier to accommodate. So I'll use myself as an example. For most of my career, I had a special office chair that was my size, I'm only four feet tall. And actually my first employer bought it for me and I just took it everywhere with me after that because it was made for me so no one else could use it anyway. So we would just reupholster it every once in a while. Um, but that was actually the only accommodation I needed for a really long time. Then I started using a scooter at work. And because they asked me instead of getting, you know, all wrapped around the axle about it, I said, all I need is a place to park my scooter in the parking garage. And so just put some yellow tape on the floor and have it say reserve for in my office number and I'll park there and take the key out, it'll be fine. But I don't have a van with a lift and I'm not gonna buy one. So that's all I needed. Then I developed hearing loss. So then I needed an amplifier on the phone and on my Bluetooth. Um, Again, not very expensive. Well, then the next thing that happened is that I developed post-traumatic stress due to all the medical stuff going on. And so I had a service dog. So now, you know, an accommodation is that if someone needs me to fly somewhere, uh, my husband comes with me to help with the wheelchair or scooter and the dog um, and keep me safe. And if I do have a fracture, help me to get the right medical care as my advocate. 
so far no one's had a, um, any reaction to that. I was worried about that when I started my consulting practice, have never had anyone blink an eye about that. So that's great. But more recently, last summer, and this is what I wrote about, I developed, I had to have some uh, hernia surgery, and it caused, um, after the healing process started, some scar tissue resulting in unpredictable bowel obstructions, which are very dangerous. And yep. you have to go to the ER right away, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, I won't get into TMI information, but now, this is the hardest accommodation I've ever had to ask for, and that is to continue to have faith. Believe that I can deliver that powerful keynote. Believe I can take on that big project. I am not going to let you down. Um, yes, it's true. I spent Christmas in the hospital because of a bowel blockage, but I've gotten the hang of it now. I have the right diet. And um, actually, that is my biggest fear about this virus. So I am being very, very, very careful about what I eat. Um, so, you know, it, the non-apparent conditions, um, mental health disabilities, uh, chronic health conditions, those are the ones that are the hardest to ask for the accommodation. And guess what? It's not costing anyone any more money. They just need to um, not get you know, so afraid that they don't employ me anymore, that they don't have right. faith in me anymore. Um, the more confidence you have in people, the more likely they will figure out a workaround, whether they need to work in the middle of the night or over the weekend to make up for some lost time, work when they feel good, which could be any time of the day, whatever it is. But um, I hope, you know, that answers the question. But I really think that is the key is to make it safe for people to ask for what they need. I agree. And people know what they need. And also, um, you want an expert in disability inclusion. And that sometimes, obviously, will be from people with disabilities. My daughter, Sarah, um, she went through a really scary um, thing and, and a whole series of things. With, as we figured out, she had a blood clot disorder. But it attacked her liver, the, all these blood clots. And she had bowel um, surgery. And then we had, we were in and out of the hospital multiple times over and over again without bowel blockage. So yeah. I'm very, very familiar with that. And we do everything we can to keep her out of the hospital because it's such, it's such a terrible experience. Yeah, exactly. it, and they're, they're wonderful, but you know, it's, it's yeah. a, t it's a tough experience. So um, the last question I want to ask you, and I'm looking at my notes a little but is, so we talked about it from the, the employer's perspective and stuff, but tell us more about if you were a person with a disability listening to this and you're walking, you know, you're, you're experiencing, I should say, all of this. What advice do you have for individuals with disabilities and people that are older that have, you know, that are now part of the disability community? What advice do you have for those people? Well, First of all, um, you can't be there for others if you don't take care of yourself. And I know they keep saying it, but it's worth repeating. I mean, you have to get enough sleep. You have to eat right. You need to exercise. Unless the weather is really horrendous outside, you need to get some fresh air and sunshine. You need to turn off the news and, and limit how much you take in. You need to do some small thing you really enjoy every day. It could be eating a popsicle. It could be reading um, a trashy romance novel. It could be watching cozy TV if you're a baby boomer, you know. Um, whatever kind of is soothing for you. And then um, when you're um, listening to others, remember that um, active listening um, and really uh, being there and listening deeply to someone is mostly what they need. Um, you're not going to be able to solve all the practical issues. Um, I have um, a person who called me from uh, Bozeman, Montana, who is very isolated and can't get groceries, you know, and I, I, I can't fly to Bozeman and go to the grocery store for her, you know, uh, but I could listen. And, you know, usually people will... Uh, talk themselves through what a possible solution might be once they feel heard. Um, and, you know, you don't want to match the panic, but you want to listen. Um, I, um, I heard today from someone 
that um, Oprah Winfrey and Deepak Chopra have um, free meditation videos um, called Hopeful. Um, so you could, if, if you want to try that, that could work. Um, I heard someone say that there's this thing you can do to be in the present because when you freak out, it's because you're in the past or you're freaking out, out about what's going to happen in the future. And it's called 54321 and you look at five things, you touch four things, you smell three things, you know, uh, you taste one thing. So it's, it, it look that up, but it's, it, it causes your body to get out of thinking about what might happen and to be in the present. Um, and, and I think we all just need to be there for each other. You know, when we think about um, it being better to give than to receive, we think about like Christmas time, right? Um, but actually, um, giving to others um, does really help in situations like this. So reach out maybe to friends you haven't talked to for a while, to family, to someone who's having to celebrate their birthday by themselves in their home, uh, to a, a neighbor um, that is, is running out of money and needs food. Um, when you do that, you'll feel better. Um, and I if, agree. I agree. If, and the last thing I'll say is if you're someone who needs help yourself, um, remember that vulnerability is a superpower because you are, if you let someone help you, that is helping them more than you. People I agree. want I agree. to do that. And, you know, you can't be too proud to ask for help. You know, you're going to have an opportunity to reciprocate in the future. You know, as my dad used to say, what goes around comes around. And um, allowing people to help you when you need help is a great gift. Um, and, and you should see it as you giving to someone else each time you do that. I agree. And I know that I checked last night on one of my friends, my younger friends that really struggles um, with mental health. And I talked to him and he's like, how did you know I needed help? And then I called an elderly neighbor today and he's like, well, I don't need anything. And I said, but if you do, I'm here. But Deb, I know we're out of time, but before we leave, and I'll make sure that we also give a link to the article that you mentioned, but will you let everybody know your website and your social media handles? And thank you so much for being on the show. But let me give you the last, um, the last words and if you'll share those. Thank you, Deb. So it's Deb at Deb Daggett Diversity. And so that's where you'll find me on the web. Um, and my social media is Deb at Twitter. Um, I also have um, a Facebook page, both personal as well as for my business. And um, I'm active on uh, LinkedIn. Um, and that's thanks to you getting me over the hump because I didn't know how to do any of that when I started my business. I was terrified, but I finally got the hang of it. I know, and, you're a maven now. <laughs> yeah, well, not like you, but at least I uh, show up at least some of the time. So. Thank you so much. I really enjoy your podcast and all the great work that you do, Deborah. And I'm so glad we've stayed friends and colleagues um, remotely. I agree. We're in this together. We're stronger together. So thank you to everybody. Please stay safe. Please stay home and stay safe. If you are one of those amazing people that are out supporting all of us during this crisis, we're praying for you. We love you. We, we are all in this together. So thank you, everyone.